Please join me in welcoming our host and the programmer of the series, Artistic Director Richard Linklater. Come on up. Thanks, Holly. Hey, guys. Um, well, how many of you guys have ever seen this movie in a theater? Very few. I saw it once, you know, when it came out. I've seen it once since. It's not really that available. I don't know why, because it's seen as one of Wilmer's, you know, when he died only a few years ago, at age almost 90, in his 90th year. Um, I, reading all bits, they really rated this film very highly. So um, you are in for a super treat. Um, I think Romer is just, I, I've been thinking about him all day. I've never introduced a Romer film, but I, you know, he, I, I found myself thinking a lot about Robert Bresson, those of you who saw L'Argent. They're both French, both, you know, kind of seen as spiritual artists in, in different ways, both very, maybe it's a French Catholic thing. They're both very precise, but in a way, their films couldn't be more different. Um, you know, Brisson's film, the actors are sort of, as he says, models, and he wants you to find your spiritual revelation through the film itself. And the, the actors kind of guide you through his narrative. Romer is, it's through these characters. And you're, you're gonna feel that, or not, kind of in how much you care about his characters. He sort of invented I don't know if he invented, but he took like talking in cinema to like a whole new level. He, he kind of created that. And I don't think anyone's had a better career. You know, if you think of like top 10 film careers ever, um, you know, he made films in, because he lived so long, you know, seven decades. He, he was never, a, but yet he was never a young filmmaker. He, he was of the French New Wave, but he was 10 years plus older than all those other guys. He had been, a, he was a, uh, literature, he was teaching, he was writing novels and literature, and I think, you know, he wrote a book on Hitchcock with Chabrol, he's just a total cinephile, he was editing Cahiers du Cinema, he was right there in the transition from critic to filmmaker, like with everyone else of that era, but he was just significantly older and kind of fully formed, I would say. You can see the other new wave directors trying to make a Hitchcock film, trying to you know, they're, they're experimenting and it's beautiful, but they're kind of all over the place. Romero made, I think he just knew what he was doing from the very beginning. He has these kind of phases of film. The first one, um, the moral, the mor six moral tales. He had them all kind of written before he even started, before he was even much of a filmmaker. It was stories he had written. So he makes, you know, those films primarily in the 60s, primarily uh, with male, you know, protagonists. Then his next body, you know, section of his filmmaking life is, which um, is uh, comedies and proverbs, which this is a part of. And, um, and then he has another one toward the end of his life. Uh, what was it? I think it was Tales of Seasons or whatever. It's like an autumn tale. All the, all the titles start to sound the same. You get them confused. They're like Ozu movies or something. Like, you know. But... Uh, <laughs> But just an, an incredible career, just an incredible artist. And I think probably the most secretive artist, not just personally, which he was. His mother died not knowing he was a famous filmmaker. What does that tell you? He had changed his name. He was so secretive. He, you know, he was going by a different name. And he just thought it, would, it was disrespectful. She didn't respect movies. So he just kind of kept that hidden. Um, no one knew a whole lot about his life. When he died, they said there was, there was a, a wife and some grown kids. They didn't know that much. You know, he just, uh, and his films are, sim I just only say that personal stuff. It's not that interesting, but it says something. He, he hides his messages in his films. He doesn't hit you over the head with anything. He, he guides you through it. And I, I will admit we're here on, I, for those of you here last week, I was just saying, you know, because of the darkness of River's Edge and some of the previous films, I said, oh, well, Next week we have a, it's summer, it'll be breezy. Well, I was, I was kind of baiting and switching you <laughs> because the lead character, like a lot of Romero characters, you go, they're, you know, they can be a little annoying. You know, you gotta find your way into them. But uh, the, lead, the lead actress here is wonderful and she co-wrote the script with him. This film is actually, I just described it as very precise and he is, but I think, in my opinion, this is kind of his loosest movie. Apparently they improvised a lot. It, it sort of flows. They shot it in 16 millimeter, almost like a documentary. He talked about, he made a lot of documentaries. If you look at his filmography, there's a lot of 
little things, but it's not seen as his features. You know, he made 20 whatever features. They're very distinct. I haven't seen many of his documentaries, but he wanted this to have kind of a documentary feel. So you're really just following this, this young woman. And, you know, she's this, you know, he, he takes the most simple stories. And this is where I think his pure genius comes out. He takes the most almost banal, ordinary people, like she's just kind of a office worker, secretary, whose summer plans get canceled. And so she's just kind of adrift in August. If you know the French, they really take that August vacation serious. So uh, <laughs> it's a big deal in her life. So uh, that's really all the film's about, you know? And so many of his films, you can't even describe them because they seem so inconsequential. And yet, he's really taking on this spiritual journey. If you, if you come aboard and go all the way with it, you know, often I say, um, you know, this film was a revelation when I saw it. And, and it was, but I mean, this film I can actually say is about a revelation. And you'll know what I mean by the end. So <laughs> I had some thoughts I just jotted down real quick what we're about to see, and this is this film, but I think it's all of Romer films. So it's a psychological study, a philosophical discourse, an unsentimental portrait of desire, feelings, opinions, thoughts, nuanced glances and gestures, awkward moments. It's emotional, intellectual, subtly, very subtly dramatic. So uh, come aboard this ride. Enjoy this, and uh, we'll, we'll be here to talk about it after. So, okay, thanks a lot. Right. Now, I've heard different things over the years, like that they had to film a year later to, to get, get the, the yeah. last shot. Yeah. I mean, I question, I question the <laughs> what we even? see a little bit. I'm like, yeah, is that? I've, I've had different feelings about that last shot. I think this is the third or fourth time I've seen this movie. You know, we had a complete Romero, mm -hmm. not a complete, but a pretty thorough one in the late '90s, and I think that was the second time I'd seen this movie. And that time, I could have sworn that I think they just kind of greened it in. <laughs> well, uh, apparently yeah. it depends on the projection to too. To you know, I saw one last summer in Greece. I will say, you I've, saw a real. You about saw three it in my life since since this movie. I'm so jealous. Yeah, I'm catching up with the old guy who's seen five. <laughs> Just never miss it when you're there. You, it's absolutely true, and uh, try, always give it a shot. I was I was convinced for a while that it was a total myth. No. Because no, I tried so hard and it, to see one. Yeah, and it's like the first time I saw one, it was like someone had just flashed a green light, like pow. I was like, whoa, that's more green than I would have imagined. Anyway, How many people have seen it? The green ray. A, a green ray. A green ray. So a couple people. They're out there. Um, How many sunsets did you have to watch in order to I get three? I don't know three? what the right ratio is, but uh, <laughs> just when, I mean, you got to be around. You got to be on the water. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to get that around here, but. Um, yeah, I guess that uh, and he was talking about the atmospheric conditions, and I guess if it's just all, a lot of things have to happen. But you can catch uh, one. Yeah, I, I, Well, I think what's neat it's it, about like that movie. is I just I love this movie more and more. Every, you know, I just love like it too. I, I used to I critique her a little more. I just I sort of really loved her tonight, and I think she's so right, even though she seems so out of sorts, so lonely, so miserable. She's actually right. She's right to turn down the sailor. She's right to not be interested in the party boy. She's right. And then when she actually meets, you know what I mean? Well, she's the question, right. the question always her. is, she's yeah, she, she's got standards. For and her. she's trying to be authentic to her experience, yeah. which doesn't really come out until the very last scene. I know, that but she's, she's such a different person when she, yeah, just and what and smile or there's something about him. He seems like a good guy. And it's sprinkled in throughout when they're, you know, when they're at the, the dinner and their family says, she's not, she's not like us, yeah. you know, and it's just sort of this understood thing, but she doesn't really understand it until later in the film. But yeah, the question is, what's up, what's up with Delphine? What is up with Delphine? I think that's like the, the, the fun like thing to discuss title, because, like, yeah, when you get, you, when you, in the beginning of the film, when she, you know, when she gets dumped and if you've never seen it before, you're probably like, oh, she's, this is a relationship, but she gets dumped from vacation, which is obviously yeah. the worst thing that could possibly happen, but it's kind of a, you get the feeling that it's a, a metaphor for, yeah. for whatever is going on with her. And it's also a treatise on, yeah, on vacation. Like, what do we think this is for? Like, what is this time? 
for us if we're trying to escape? What are we? What 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 is the meaning of it? And I think for for the French who go on it every year, maybe that question is is different than for us who we we try to not go on vacation. In yeah, US. Americans, we don't even we don't even have vacations anymore. <laughs> but uh, yeah, they take it very serious. I was in Paris once. I was filming there. It was in August. Went over there in August, and Paris was just empty. Yeah. Everybody was just. Not there. Well, it's still that way. I mean, yeah. in August you go and you think, oh, the world is changing, but I mean, no, no one's working. So if you want, oh, they'll be back in three weeks. The <laughs> shops closed. You can't. It's, it's, they're serious. The restaurant you really wanted to go to, yeah. it's August. You can't do it. Yeah. But, um, well, I was wondering, uh, you know, about because Romero was a just total, um, thorough, probably the most thorough approach to filmmaking, like. If you ever, ever read Nestor Elmendros, the great cinematographer, he wrote a book called The Man with a Camera. And he, his first film was with Romero, I think, uh, one of his 60s films. But he did a lot of, not this one, but a lot of the early mm -hmm. films into the, into the 70s pretty far. And I think, you know, even in the 80s, I think he did Pauline at the Beach. and stuff. So he worked with him pretty consistently over about a 20 year, 20 <laughs> plus year period. And he talks about, like, talk about economy. Mm -hmm. He said the crew is like five people. There's a e one electrician, cameraman, him, operator, and DP, and uh, one sound person, one gaffer, and Romero does everything. He's script supervisor, hair, makeup, he's cast it, they've spent months. Um, the schedule is like, okay, we're going to shoot this day because that's when the roses are going to bloom. He's checked it from a year before. Everything is planned. He even said one time um, it was in the schedule that it snowed and on that day it snowed because he had, you know, he accused him, he has this quote of being in league with the devil. Because <laughs> he just had everything so thoroughly planned. And I see his films, not this one, do you agree with me? This is kind of the most, it's most for, straightforward. because And it atmospheric so, in a way, environmental. It's like. But it's it, so focused on her, on yes. one person. A lot of his films are, there's multiple characters and very intricate complex narratives. This is, in a way, the simplest narrative that I can think of. You know what I mean? I it's think, all I, in a way, in a way that's true, like but yes, it's, it's, it's that. You're in her head, because the others, you're kind of bouncing around. There's some, some Right, and you like, have, and you're sort of on the, in, you know, in terms of him, you know, the, co the comedies, which, yeah. you know, this is one of them, then you're, you're following a couple different people's yeah. mor morality and sort of they're coming, uh, they're yeah, coming they're, to terms, they're, yeah. each of them, and then this, you're really just, it's really just it's hers. It's her, it is her, and she's, she's wonderful, and she had been in a few of his films, I think, it's almost like a Mike Lee film, you sort of work your way up to first team. <laughs> and she had approached like, him okay, when initially too. She had she had gone t to Romero, being like saying, "I want to work with you," and, yeah. and yeah. so it was really her that that came to him, and then they did this Years together. Years before, but I think he just liked her and thought he could base a whole movie around her. And he did this with other films. He would, it's an interesting working methodology. He would um, just have people come in and interview them for months, and then kind of work their characters around who he thought they really were to some degrees. A lot of pulling things out of their own lives. But what is so cinematic, and I think you were talking in the beginning about how talky the Romero movies are, but the, what, what's so cinematic about her is everything in her movement is that character. You know, the sort of ambling around the beach, just, know. you know, so lanky and just sort of Feel being it. like, am I pulled this direction or this <laughs> direction? And it's just so, so um, full. And I, I just, yeah. where the, the perfection of the performance is, is yes. once in a lifetime. Great. And I read, I read an interview with her once where she talked about the two guys they meet near the end, not the last guy, of course, but before that, like one of those guys, they just went and got a guy off the beach that afternoon. Like one was an actor and one, and I don't even know which one, actually. I was watching it close, <laughs> thinking about that, because the more talkative guy, maybe he's just this kind of gregarious guy. Yeah. Maybe he's the non-actor and the other guy. <laughs> so like, like, who, who knows? I'd like to find out. So even I read about the um, so the lunch scene where she reveals that she's vegetarian, yeah. and most of that was the direction that he had given to the other characters was like just really push her on this, like yeah. something like that was like yeah, you know, keep talking about this vegetarian thing, and then you and you get that it was it's amazing. So painful to me. I, I love it though, but it's like oh man, you're suddenly on the spot. You have to you know totally justify. It. And they do not let it's it go. Great. I think there's. Maybe there's two cameras there, and that's really mm -hmm. improvised because he doesn't really do that a lot. He does that in this scene, but like I said in the intro, he he doesn't do that a lot in his career. 
it was much more precise. But I think he just knew he could. He knew that would work for this movie because it's just a little different than his other. And I think that's his genius too. I mean, you can't, you, you can't. Most people can't create a scene like that from just. This is this no. is going to be improvised. It's the, it's, yeah, it's it never it, works. Yeah. Really. Amazing. Or, or it, it could, it's just usually not that interesting in a, in a film, but he has the right structure that it builds and it actually is heading somewhere and it, it means something. I just love the feeling of this movie. It's yeah. like yeah. it's like he has an interest in not just people, but the cultural structures that sort of push people to behave in a certain way. And I think that 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 get, lends this really wonderful depth to it. I I just the the feeling of this movie. I'm always just like, oh yes. Yeah. It's so good. Kind of this career long, lifelong obsession with kind of young people and mm -hmm. choices. And he always did, there were always young people. You know, like who's the oldest person, <laughs> lead character in a Romare movie? Maybe early on, maybe. It got yeah. younger as he got older. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that means. But, <laughs> but to do it in a way he that feels has beautiful like. Beautiful people. You yeah. Know, young women and young men. They're always, you know, he just kind of like likes the human form, I think. The clothes, though. Eighties <laughs> Europe. I don't know. There, <laughs> Sorry, what? How many bathing suits does she have? How many bathing suits does she have? Yeah. Well. You know, I, I wanted to say I, I don't think the story is very remarkable, and if you just saw that on paper, it's just like black, black, shades of gray, worse, about black, you know. But she really just brings it to life in such mm -hmm. a way that. You know, it's not it's not that the story is so telling. Yes. I mean, it's almost like a Johnny One Note thing, yes. but 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 she's so, so fascinating that it just yeah. just makes it work, right? You know, it just just really you know, keeps you involved all the way through. This is where the master's art work when you're like, okay, all of the rules that you know today, there's so many like screenwriting and this is how you make a movie, and like pretty much none of those rules would, would apply here. First level of a screenwriting course is like, well, why should we like her? Yeah. You know, she doesn't. She has a. Uh, you know, that's not. Audiences won't relate to her. That's a fact. You know, and yet, you know, but that's what's something's about. more mysterious about it. Yeah. Some thoughts over here. Uh, I was just curious if you knew if if he had one editor that he worked with most of his career, or or does he edit that, or? I think he more or less edits. Apparently, he never spent much time editing because it they all came together so simply. He was never like shoot a whole bunch and find it in the editing room. They're all it's all pretty planned out, and he shoots it so simply. I don't think I, I never. Yeah, I, I heard how quickly like Boonwell or something never spent more than a week editing any film. It, you can do that if it's just you're shooting exactly what Fassbender too is another that comes to mind. You just never, you just don't shoot anything you're not going to use. You know exactly how it's pieced together. That's, that's, and it's one way to make a film. You just you kind of know how it's going to come together and you just do those parts and that's your movie. So I think he's more in that category than the other. This though, apparently they didn't do more than one take of all these, but I have to think that's there's some, I, a lot. I mean, he's got a structural device that gives him a lot of leeway to improvise something and then mm -hmm. go, okay, well, that wasn't that interesting. I'll just, you know, something I, And else. I, I think also just don't underestimate what Marie Riviere brings because yeah. in some of those scenes, he had not directed her to cry. And she yeah. had, and but she sensed, in a movie where there's one take, he, she's like. He needed that or he was looking for that. Yeah. So, yeah, she talked about, hey, it was just this presence and she just kind of felt he would just be standing there behind the camera. And apparently it's, um, go, you know, and she just kind of felt something. It's magical. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think Sophie Montagnon, is, is the DP, I think this is the first mm -hmm. collaboration that they had okay. together. Yeah. Um, and he worked with, and he worked with a number of DPs over the course of yeah, his career. Yeah, many, many. El Mendros was, was mm -hmm. one of the big ones. But there was the hand over here, oh, behind you, and then I'm going to move it. It's not like, you know what I mean? There's a certain Romero, unmistakable style, tone, mm -hmm. pace. I can't think of another director really who has the same vibe. I mean, there are different stories, obviously, different characters, different times and places. But God, you just know you're in a, in that film, in his whole body of work. You never. I mean, he did the period films. He has that handful yeah. of you know Percival, and right. the Lady and the Duke, time. sort of toward the end, yeah. But still, they have this kind of beautiful feel to them. 
And I think it is that it is that idea of like there's these conversations, but it's not like the script is it just it adds up to something so much bigger. And these sometimes the conversations seem so minor, it's just like but they 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 add up in this way that's so so deep. What are there? There were other there's a thought right here. Yeah. I thought it was interesting that you said that her behavior just was so right at the end of the movie. You kind of realize, you, you go through the movie thinking that she is this very annoying person, and then it turns out that she was right to, you know, like reject these guys and to kind of wait. And I, you know, like I'm kind of curious, I mean, you know, like uh, thinking about how, what might have happened after this movie. I mean, sometimes I can sort of like imagine what would have happened next, but this one I'm kind of a little stumped. And I think part of it is that the reason that she was open to the, I, 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 part of it makes me, I, I wonder if she was open to that guy at the end because she had said no so many times that she had reached a point of desperation where she realized that she had to do something. And so she finally opened herself up to that guy because, you know, like it's now or never. And is she gonna be that person afterwards or is she yeah, gonna go back to being the annoying vegetarian at the <laughs> I don't connect with this necessarily, but uh, um, I think she's not um, that annoying anymore. I, I think she's just, you know, when you're just in the wrong place physically, like, why am I here? You, you've done that where you, you maybe your plans change or what am I doing here? You're just in the wrong place. And that's her dislocation. And it's that starts to include all the people you're meeting too. You're just like, what am I doing here? And it's a depiction of that. And I think finally she, she kind of gets on track. I, I, I think I, for some reason, I think on this screen, that guy is somehow different. She intuits something different, yeah. and he's, I think it's a puzzle fitting together rather than a, a projection out of desperation. It just doesn't seem like she would do that much, or she's probably done that in the past. She looks like someone who's kind of so self-aware. She's learned her lessons about her own behaviors and what comes after that, so, so she's protecting herself. <laughs> yeah, th they should have made a sequel. <laughs> Although I think the Romero lesson is always like life goes on. Yeah. It's like not like it's it's not like yeah. there is an end in sight. No, it's just like things don't have like we'll keep going. Yeah, and there's so yeah. You know, it's like a, may or may not. You're just getting this part of it. It goes. <laughs> there's no. Uh, yeah, there's not a lot of definitive endings <laughs> to his movies. You know, some people end their movies. You know, <laughs> Cronenberg comes to mind. <laughs> Those movies end. You know? um, but he's. No, they just kind of keep going. And it's sort of like lessons have been learned, yeah. but we're evolving. Um, so we, we, I saw those hands, yeah. but you seem to have a response to the gentleman, so. I just, I, uh, uh, not to completely disagree with him, but first of all, I just thought it was so evocative of this period of life where, you know, you're in your 20s or your, you know, whatever, 20s, and you're completely uncomfortable in your own skin, vaguely dissatisfied, like nothing is right, and annoying, it's really annoying, you know, but- It's an annoying the, age, it's but annoying Yeah, people. it's <laughs> annoying to be that, yeah. and I think that she expresses that so well, it's so beautiful that way, yeah. and, um, and I was so relieved when the old people showed up, um, you know, when the, the line of crones or whatever, like the, the women in their 40s talking about the green ray, you know? It was a beautiful, a beautiful thing because it's like her discomfort made me really happy to be 50, you know? <laughs> because I remember that so well. But, um, but also the ending, it also just recalled to me so many great um, endings that are similar, like The Graduate or Choose Me or Say Anything, where it's this moment of like, we're leaping off the cliff you know, and here we are, and so you might wonder what happens, but it's just kind of that, that This one's job. interesting, because it's internal to hear that the guy she met has no idea, I yeah, mean, she I talks about it, but he has no idea the depths of what it could possibly mean to her. Right. He didn't get yeah. all that context, and yet he's there kind of in spirit, so it's a moment between them that's really her, you know, it's yeah, her revelation. I just love that it's all prompted by 
an overheard random conversation. You know, right. just yeah. his note is like there's revelations out there. Just have your ears open and your eyes open, and you know, you don't know what's lurking in this reality. You know, it's just kind of a beautiful notion. There was a thought over here. Yes, ma'am. Um, so I came a little late, so I missed the introduction. I didn't know if um, this is a perfect question, but I'll ask it anyways. Did uh, Delphine's character inspire uh, Celine by any chance? Or did you take a lot of um, In my, in the before trilogy? Yeah. Um, I, you know, I, I never thought of it specifically. But I think this film, his style, and, and so is probably so thoroughly a, you know, part of my cinematic thinking. Yeah. yeah I but I don't think they're that. Yeah, I don't know. I hadn't really thought about. I think Julie Dove is pretty different than. Yeah. Her. But you're Both just, self-aware. You're just grouping them together because they're French, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I do like self-aware characters. <laughs> yep. It's interesting, like the gentleman over there kind of talked about how it was like she had changed, like she had had a re revelation, and for me it felt more like, like as an audience member, like my perception of her had changed. Like, mm -hmm. like she, it's not like she got better. It's like I was being a jerk earlier, and like now, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. I was you feel bad for judging her. Yeah. <laughs> it's like all you have to do is get to know someone. And it was kind of rewarding because I feel like I've grown. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> it's true. It's true. And what what are those qualities that it, it pulled out of you? Just what patience, understanding. Yeah. It's like empathy. Like yeah, empathy. Yeah. Yeah. That you just those are real problems. You know, you can blow them off in each other, but it, it's real. There was one down here, and then we'll come over here. Yes. Yeah, I was. Um, yeah, I think that too. Like I just grew to like her better. Yeah. Um, I didn't. Like her at the beginning, but then I start to, yeah, she did start to go on too much for me. But, um, <laughs> but towards the end, then you start to have more empathy. But then I was thinking when you're talking about the type of warmer movie that it is, um, and and how it feels, and I was trying to think of other. You're mentioning not other directors like not having it, you're not being able to place any other kind of movies like that. The only one I could think of is um, Sex Lies and Videotape. And she kind of reminds me of Anne, that character in there. Right. Which is like not fitting in and not like wanting the things that other people want. Yeah, and then so meeting yeah, this mysterious sure. guy That's and like true. suddenly being drawn to him. Sort of being a little outside the norm yeah. and what, you know, not they're really looking for a path that's alternative. And actually, actually, that's kind of true for other characters in Romeo movies, too. Um, that they're kind of, people are sort of picking their own path and setting themselves apart a lot of times. Um, over here, yes, ma'am. Yeah, I think that's an interesting pers uh, perception of how we started viewing her had changed, but I think more so she started looking at herself differently. In the beginning, I really felt she wasn't, and I think the lady said it very well, she wasn't comfortable in her own skin. And I think that's why she was changing venues, trying to see mm -hmm. where she could fit in, if a different environment would make her feel better about herself. And I think towards the end, she finally realized she had to feel contentment within yeah. herself to start feeling happiness around her. And that's how I, I visualized her and her transition throughout the film. Yeah, if you're not happy that a location moving to a place isn't going to, no, a very short term patch. You know, we all friends who just move at the drop of a hat, you know, it's like you're just running. There's one right here, and then, yeah, a couple more. She's on the cusp, but I think <laughs> <laughs> For those in the back, um, she checked to see if Marie Vivier, the lead actress, was a Capricorn, and she's apparently on the cusp. I think she is, though, because it's the 22nd of December. 22nd of December. Yeah, and I, I, I'm trying to think, like, are, is that stuff in other Romeo movies? Does he do that with other characters? I can't think of any good examples, but it made me wonder, you said that they wrote it together, so I was wondering yeah. if it was more her or him, and... I was also wondering if you ever think about astrology with your characters. Um, that was probably probably her. He probably liked that quality in her or something. I don't know. Uh, it's hard to say. Would a guy like Roman 
believe in astrology. Yeah, well, that's so, I mean, I think you're really hip on it. No now idea. Because I noticed, just thinking about it, watching it, and they talked about the Capricorn being the goat climbing the mountain. Yeah. She does a lot of climbing yeah. up and down <laughs> in this movie. Like, she's going downstairs, she's going upstairs, yeah, yeah. which fits thematically, you know, because she's just trying to find her place. But it's also funny because she's supposed to be on vacation. So it's like, why is she pushing this up the mountain? She's supposed to be on vacation. But. Layers of astrology meaning in this movie. Those, cards, or those, those are tarot cards, though, right? What no, are they're just playing cards. Oh, they're just playing cards. Yeah. That's right, that's right, of course. It looks like, it looks like a tarot. Yeah, it has a pretty elaborate design on the back. But yeah, it's just a, the queen and king. Yeah, okay, that's right. Okay, there was some other thoughts. Yes, it's right behind. Yep. When would you be discussing this movie if she hadn't seen the Green Ray at the end? <laughs> would it still be a movie uh, that, that we would see? Yeah. Could, it end, could it end with, no? <laughs> yeah, like, uh, well, he has one, early, you know, a little bit earlier, you see one where not going to happen. My memory of the movie, because I didn't see it, um, like I, I, don't, I don't remember where I watched it, but it certainly wasn't in the theater, and I didn't see it, so I was like, oh, she just imagined it. You know, if you, if <laughs> so you it really believe, affects the interpretation. It is true. There is a method to seeing the right in the movie, and it's called not blinking. You know, it, it just take a few, as the sun's getting low, just kind of close your eyes, and then stay open. I've learned that over watching this movie, because if you blink, you literally miss it. I think they kind well, of did a little color, <laughs> color enhancement, maybe. Smart. Well, Marie Revere said it's not just the ending. She said the color and the amount of light in the projection will affect your whole reading of this movie, according to her. Which you know, there's, which is interesting, I think, because and I was thinking about that watching it this time because it's incredibly hazy, mm -hmm. and that was where we were talking about his playing the devil. I mean, that the haziness adds so much to the meaning of the film, this idea of like the weather sucks, like yeah. is the sun ever going to come out? And I don't know if you'd catch that in a different in, you know, a different projection of the movie because it's a little subtle. Yeah, I wonder why it's only in the US is it called summer. Everywhere else it's called the green ray. I wonder why the US distributor hmm. or I don't know whose decision that was. I wonder how he felt about it. It is summer movie. It's, I mean, it's, I actually it's like kind of the ti I like the title summer. Yeah, I so. never thought. You know, I'm only now thinking about that. But I actually, I've worked with the, uh, the guys who distributed like all the real movies. They, they were Ryan Classics in that time, and then became Sony Classics, and they just kind of did all his films. And they said that this is just a side note. They were like, "Oh, he's such a cheapskate. He d doesn't have a set photographer." So you can't get, you need photographs to, to you know, just how, tr how much trouble it was working with him about, he was just so minimal. He didn't have photos, he didn't have hardly anything. Which explains a lot of the yeah. like really shitty photos yeah. <laughs> out there that you just, they're basically like screen grabs, it's all yeah, screen grabs. Yeah, which kind of crappy back in the day especially, yeah, frame grabs, but um, there weren't a lot of pictures of him either. He was, I mean, there are, but he's kind of unphotographed. I mean, he did interviews. When films came out, you can read interviews with him, but he was kind of, you know, a bit of a mystery. Maurice Shrevich. Right, which is, that's his, his real name. name. Mm -hmm. The other New Wave guys called him Momo. Maurice was his real name, so they didn't call him uh, Momo. Yeah, uh, when I, when I, just now just watched the movie I actually didn't see the green light and I'm really wondering what would it have been like going home like man what a downer <laughs> but uh in blow up did you see the body in the picture or not you know <laughs> it's a different film <laughs> but uh is it? You know. an, an element of uh just the meaning of the green ray and how it applies to her her color screen and we, a couple people mentioned like how she changed in this movie, and I, I see it more as she doesn't change, just something just happens. Like she didn't have this big revelation. It's just this guy was there to see this one glimmer of part of her personality that lets people in instead of backs them off. Like so, like that's she doesn't change, but. Uh, we get at right before the very end of the movie, like the we get, a thing, right? we get like a nice little a little problem. light of yeah. happiness and cheer. <laughs> so is that kind of 
so the, the right guy in the right circumstances for her, she will go back to being the woman of the first <laughs> part of the, of the most of the movie. Do you think so? You don't want to marry her, is that <laughs> you just can't make her happy. <laughs> Some people, yeah. Do we can, can any of us change? We don't know. Yes, over here. She's just, I mean, like she said, she's just so open and she's not manipulative. She doesn't have an agenda where everyone else around her seems to. They're trying to push her to something or like the German girl, her conversation in 10 minutes with no substance with this guy just makes her sick. You know, everything yeah, but she she's having fun is open is and meaningful. Yeah. Right, right. She's looking for meaning or substance. Yeah, yeah but I think to her it just doesn't happen if it doesn't feel right. Just like the Green Ray, everything just has to be right, yeah. and then it comes She's out. Just having trouble faking it in this yeah. world. You know, you yeah. really have to be able to kind of. You know, she you to be a social it. being. You kind of have to be able to do that. Yeah, come on, go dancing. She's well, just not. Yeah, go dancing. It'll make you happy. It's like. <laughs> well, no one likes a party pooper. You know, <laughs> if you think that's fun, and no one, you know, it's like. Yeah. Delphine, no one likes a party pooper. Yeah. I saw something on TV, Longhorn Channel, last night also with your interview, and you said something about spiritual. Was on the Longhorn Channel? Just realizing I stole the envy for boyhood. <laughs> yeah, I just, if you really put it together, it's like, yeah, he kind of goes off to college. I didn't even. I'm just like, so, yeah. <laughs> they don't see it green, right? But he kind of meets them and they have a moment. It's drug induced, but you know, whatever. <laughs> no, whatever. But what was the question? I was just kind of. <laughs> Spiritual. That was yeah. in your in the words you used yeah, at the well, beginning, I think. Like, but like, kind of what it, was that making any sense? The Brisson thing, like that. They're yeah. both very spiritual yeah. artists. They just go about trying to convey that in completely different ways. Yeah. And I don't, I don't think one is better, or I wouldn't even prefer one to the other. Like Catholicism versus Buddhism. Yeah, or maybe. <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, I think it's funny that he breaks the rules about like you know, not having that much plot, certainly not having any action or anything, but he's, the, the other rule I think he's breaking is like, he just kind of gives you the meaning, or like he spells it out very explicitly, like the Green Ray thing is like pretty blatant, and the, the whole scene about describing the fairy tale and saying like, it's like Cinderella or Snow White, and then even having the guy stand up at the end and be like, let me explain it to you further, like, it's just about atmosphere and like something happens, like, everything becomes very explicit in a way that like the Brisson is not at all, like, I don't understand the meaning of the Brisson movie at all. It's very enjoyable, but I don't really like know how to codify what it's saying. Where he, right. here he's just like, here's what it means. Like, yeah. <laughs> very, very straightforward. I think he wanted to communicate in a different way. Very, you know, his characters are so self-consciously exploring their themselves, their thoughts, everything. In every movie, they will tell you their taste, and you know, sometimes they're self-delusional, not necessarily right. But they're trying, you know, they're always talking and, you know, trying to make sense of things, you know, so. Okay, we have, maybe let's just take one more thought and then we should probably talk about next week, so. I'm just curious where the playing cards came from. <coughs> Anybody? <laughs> playing cards. <laughs> that to me is actually seems like a weird actually, device for Romare. Yeah, a little bit. They seem kind of placed. But, you know, just some little mystery. But, you know, the way you kind of draw connections in the world, like the way she says, oh, that, and then I was wearing green, and 
And even though we see the Greenway at that little business hut, you know, whatever that beach <laughs> thing is, yeah. it's like, ah, oh, you know, synchronicity. You know, if you're just attuned, you, you put all kinds of stuff together that is, you know, technically completely random, but we ascribe meaning to wherever we wish to. So, you know, if you look around and find it, look, I mean, there's been a lot of playing cards made in this world. There's probably on the ground right now. You know, so if you find one, if you find another, it doesn't mean it means anything. It's just, they're out there. I don't know. It's what whatever you want to bring to it. So I, th I find that kind of thinking pretty fascinating. But, yeah, it does seem like a, a prop, a, uh, yeah, what's the word, a, yeah, a little device. Yeah. It doesn't have a lot of devices. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. It's been a movie that's so kind of antithetical to that. Mm. What, um, I'm curious actually, because you didn't say in the beginning where you initially saw the film. I remember seeing it um, just here in town. I think at the, when it <coughs> opened, you know, it came out, play a couple weeks. You know. <coughs> he was never, you know, he's just one of those art film, you know, the films came out, mm -hmm. they played in New York for, few months, they'll play everywhere else for a few weeks, and you know, I always tried to go to all of them. He had a great, a great 80s. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember the first Romero film I saw was, I kind of got off to not the best start, The Aviator's Wife. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's anyone's favorite film of his. Yeah. That was in the early 80s. So I, I kind of liked it, but I kind of didn't. I was kind of, eh. But what came after that, you know, Calling at the mm -hmm. Beach, and um, Rondo Green, you know the the whole eighties. He had a, he had a very good eighties and and nineties. You know he just he had a great what an incredible career. But I think I saw it at the Arbor back back then. I'm not sure. So next week the last edition of this Mishima. Jewels in the Wasteland. Yeah, which is really if you want to think of I've been kind of obsessed on biopics lately. How do you how do you express someone's life? You know. Of, of, you know, a person, especially a writer's life. How do you express a writer? <laughs> it's like the hardest thing to do to f make a film about a writer. You know, how do you do it? Um, so, I, and again, I haven't seen it in a long time, but I remember at the time thinking it's you know really bold. But the idea of um, a life in four chapters. Well, if I'm, if I'm remembering correctly, those chapters are scenes out of various novels Mishima has mm -hmm. written but also kind of apply to him in some way. And they're very, just beautifully designed and um, it's just such a complex uh, character. And you can see Schrader just being kind of obsessed with this guy, an artist who's mm -hmm. um, kind of pushing himself, who's out of, totally out of um, place and time. You know, he was a throwback to the emperor. <laughs> you know, yeah. he's, I mean, he died in 1970, so, but, um, and just wonderful performances, and uh, you know, just a, just kind of a beautiful film and a real outlier in the '80s. It's amazing that a film like that could get made. It was such a, you know, and I remember Schrader actually saying that that was the film that kind of got him kicked out of the industry for good. <laughs> it's like, okay, you really you're gonna make a Japanese film? <laughs> you really aren't one of us anymore, you know? Because he had written, you know, he was directing a lot of movies. He had a, had a good '80s, made a lot of good movies, but that he felt that put him way outside. Well, I so think you really succeeded in the programming of this second part of the series being very much what we would not expect from the 80s. And Romero, in a way, couldn't yeah. be more 80s, and uh, particularly yeah. in the costuming. Um, yeah. But <laughs> yeah, they're the signifiers of a time, but they're really yeah. eternal. Yeah. Like, you yeah. could kind of do this movie 100 years from now, I'm sure, you yeah. know, vacations. It's not, all his films are kind of beautifully eternal, I think. But yeah, every one of these films, I, it's always just, I, my guiding principle was something I wanted to see again that just seemed to really stand out from the pack and was worth uh, examining again all these years later. Like if I'm still thinking about it, well, I'm always wondering how good a movie is it? Is it better than I remember? Is it maybe not? You know, it's funny how films age in your mind. And I have a very good memory for movies. I kind of remember so much of them, but I, I'm amazed how little of this Really? Yeah, I remember I have high points, mm -hmm. but the day to day of it, I remember like, oh, the vegetarian, yeah. <laughs> you know, the meetings with some of the guys and stuff. But it, so much of it just kind of flows. I don't, it didn't, I'm not saying that's good or bad. It's just, I like processing it. Mm -hmm. It's just more like the process. So.
Well, thank you all so much for participating in the conversation yeah, and for staying this, and this for coming really to the movies. Thanks for being here. So. We'll see you, see next, you week next week and in between. Oh, hey, can I plug a thing I'm doing next Tuesday night? I think it's yes. next Tuesday yes. night. Tuesday night. It's the Paramount Theater, our, our beautiful, wonderful Paramount Theater, celebrating their 100-year anniversary. They asked me to show a film that I've shown there before, and I thought, well, since it's also the 100th the centennial of Orson Welles' birth, and there's these celebrations going on about Welles, that I was going to show a movie um, that I did about Welles, set in 1937. So if you haven't seen it, come by. Me and Orson Welles, it is a yeah. wonderful it, it, it movie. It didn't get much and distribution. It's one of my ones that I kind of feel bad for, like, I never really got seen that much. I mean, we had a great screening here way back when, but... Uh, you know, if you weren't around. Come, I think it's really it exciting because yeah, I know that favorites. not everyone if has seen it. And I can say that. It's one of my own. It's, it's actually like the way screening, just a film I want to see again. Like, I don't really watch my, my own films again, but that one I said, you know, I want to watch that again. I just want to hang out with those people. And, you know, so it's, it's in that category for me. So, anyway, next Tuesday. And it's a beautiful period piece. So, seeing it at the yeah, Paramount right, will be. Yeah. Exciting. So it's at 7 p.m. and it's ab absolutely free to the general public. If you're an AFS right. member and you bring your membership card, we have a reserved seating area in the mezzanine. So just bring your membership card and we'll okay. show you to your seats and we'll and see we you on Tuesday. Mishima the next night here. Yep. So. Yay. Movies next <laughs> okay. week. Good night. Bye, everybody.